Well, welcome to our podcast today, the 24th of January. And today we have a special speaker at the Aspen Chapel, James Finley, who's part of Richard Draw's Living School and an international meditation teacher, is coming to teach us on the nature of unity of consciousness. Some words from Thomas Merton. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will doesn't mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. I'd like to uh, reflect with you on this passage for maybe about 20 minutes, is that right? 15, 20 minutes. And then we don't sit again after that, do we? There's no leap. So, okay. Uh, this text is going to be available to you on the internet. You'll post it. It'll be in a weekly email. And it's found in Merton's book, Thoughts in Solitude. It's a beautiful passage. I'd like to walk through the passage with you on spiritual teachings in Thomas Merton. My Lord God, I have no idea uh, where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. That we, we all have some need for some sense that we have some idea of what's going to happen to us next. For example, most of us are assuming that when the service is over, we're going to leave here. And you have some idea of what you're going to do next. And you have some sense of that. It has a lot of familiarity to you. And most likely, that's just what will happen. But maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. How often does it happen in life? where you were going along, look back at your own. I, I said, look back at your own life up till now, right up to this moment. You couldn't have planned it if you tried. You could not have. See, how has it come to pass that you have come to be the person you are right now? Experiencing your life the way you're experiencing it, understanding what you understand, being who you are. Look back when you were 12, 13, 19, 20, like that. Look at the journey, the circuitous journey, 10,000 cul-de-sacs, really. You could not have planned it if you tried. Yet we labor under the illusion we're finally figuring it out. You know? Imagine you come across a journal that you kept maybe 20 years ago, even forgot you wrote the darn thing. You sat down and you start to read it, the things you worried about, the things you wondered about, the things you were so clear about. It's clear that if the, woman, if the man or woman who wrote that journal 20 years ago could see the you who's reading it now, that person would faint. See? <laughs> We're so clueless. We are so clueless about the unfoldings of the heart and the qualitative transformations that take place. See? And we're midstream in this unforeseeability of ourselves. See? 
There is foreseeability, this is true. But running to foreseeability is a threat of unforeseeability for all of us. Or we do not see the road ahead of us. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood. I took the one less traveled by and it made all the difference. And uh, life is a series of these choices, the accumulative effect of which is the texture of our heart. And Merton here is acknowledging this. <clears throat> now to the ego, this is disconcerting. Because we're afraid to lose the control that we think that we have over the life that we think that we're living. See? <laughs> we just love having a planned life. So <laughs> I think I'm all set. I got this covered. See? And, uh, but uh, every so often, uh, you know, a trap door opens and you're blindsided by some unforeseeable thing right in front of you. You didn't see it coming. You did not see it coming. And it transforms everything. Sometimes it's very blissful. Sometimes it's utterly tragic. When you're actually going through it, you can't believe that it's happening to you. Sometimes it's subtle, 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 subtle. But life's like this. And so he starts out then, it's kind of humility in a way. Lord, my Lord, God, I have no idea where I'm going, nor do I see the road ahead of me. There's something else here. See? That when, when I die, when my moment of death comes and the veil parts, and you will infinitely take me into the infinity of yourself, I cannot comprehend my destiny in you. That I, I, I have no, I can't grasp. You know, the Buddhists talk about a frog born and living in a well. And when someone tells the frog about the ocean, the little frog only thinks of a very big well. See, because <laughs> the frog can't take in the ocean. <clears throat> and so we're all well frogs when it comes to death. And we're clueless. We're utterly God's great surprise party, which is the, the eternal surprise party of unforeseeability as our destiny. And we get little echoes of it here. That's how the, the prayer starts. Really. I cannot know for certain where it will end. See, I do not know the outcome of the situation or all the situations to come. Nor do I really know myself. I have some idea of who I am. That's important. I'm a psychotherapist, psychologist, I'm just retired. <laughs> And uh, it's important to have a sense of who you are and how to be true to who you are. It's a process. But there's also the mysterious unknowability of yourself. How I share it is, notice when you don't know someone very well, it's easy to say, it's easy to say a lot about them. Let me tell you about so-and-so. <laughs> when you've loved someone very, very deeply for a long, long, long time, you hardly know what to say. And your heart breaks when you try. You know, no matter what you'd say, it wouldn't be what you know because you can't say it. Gabriel Marcel says, we know we learned to love someone when we glimpsed in them that which is too beautiful to die. And we know we learned to love ourselves when we glimpsed in that in us which is uh, uh, too beautiful to die. See? This is the unfigure out ability of ourself. No matter how hard you try to figure yourself out, you'll never figure yourself out. You get a spiritual hernia trying to figure yourself out. <laughs> Because you're not figure outable. You're not figure outable. That's what prejudice is. Prejudice is your idea about a person is that person. Your idea of yourself is yourself. But that's the ideological life. But love keeps breaking the ideologies open. It keeps asking us to go deeper, open our heart wider, like this. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact I think I'm following your will does not mean I am actually doing so. I want to have integrity and faith to follow your will, which is to live by love. All things considered, what's the most loving thing I can do now for my body, my mind, this person, this family, this community, this earth? All things considered, if I live by love. Because you are love. God has revealed to us as love. And I want to live by love. I want to live by the truth of love. But the fact I think I'm doing that does not mean I'm actually doing so. Why? Why? Because I'm a precious... Thomas Merton said, we're all a bunch of dopes, but we're loved dopes. <laughs> Someone once said, when I was young, uh, I couldn't figure out, when I was a teenager, why my father was so stupid. See, now that I've gotten older, I couldn't figure out how I got so smart. See, 
And so we amazingly are blindsided by what we thought we knew. And humility is experiential knowledge. See, like this, I, I want to do. So my sincerity, I have to be open. I'm subject to self-deception. That's humility. I have, I have a certitude in my heart, but it has to be grounded in humility that I'm always open to places of things I need to look at, things I need to explore. I need to stay open to things like this and not close in like this. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you and I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I am sincere in wanting to be open to do your will even though I may be lost in all kinds of subtle diversions and compromises of my heart. And I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. Sincerity in the presence of God. I hope I will never do anything apart from my desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, that though I may know nothing about it. You know, sometimes I work with people who are in the depths of the destruction of addiction. We're ritualistically acting out trauma and abandonment, making a series of reenacted hurtful choices. And they get to a very vulnerable place where they feel so lost. They feel so lost. And in the moment they pause and open themselves to who they are in the middle of their situation, they can unexpectedly come upon the invincible preciousness of themselves in the middle of the situation, in the middle of their confusion. That even though I may be lost, even though I may be lost, I know that you know always right where I am. You always know exactly where I am. You, God, it isn't as if God could come here right now as a surprise guest speaker, walk up to the podium. We'd all be amazed, autographing Bibles, G-O-D, best wishes. <laughs> <laughs> you say to God, you know, I read your book. Well, <laughs> I'm working on another one. You are? <laughs> And that's the trouble with Revelation. Those for whom the book is written, they think they own the copyright to God's final work. <laughs> and I know that if I do this, you'll lead me by the right road, even though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. <clears throat> See, I may, Thomas Merton says, I get to a place where there will be nothing left of me but to realize that I am my own mistake that your love permeates me through and through and through. You are smitten by me, and you take me to yourself unexplainably. And I put my confidence in that, and not my confidence in my ability to figure out the unfigure out ability of the miracle of my life. And I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. This is the deep peace that surpasses understanding. We don't know what's coming next, but we do know no matter what it is, we can have confidence that God will be explainably right there, sustaining us in the, in the invincible, virginal immediacy of that moment, regardless of that moment, no matter what it is. Really. And that's the peace in our heart. And therefore, I think you could sit, you know how we did the practice, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You could sit with this passage for several weeks and just take the first text, my Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. Breathe that in, sit with that, journal it out. Take another week on the next sentence, another week on the next sentence, like a mantra, like let it soak in and walk around with it and take it to heart. Let's just uh, close our eyes maybe and <clears throat> just think about those perhaps who are suffering at the moment that we know. We think of Philip Carter, Susan's husband, who's going in for open heart surgery on Thursday. Think of Patricia Hill, 
Paula Johnson. I have Sasha's mother, Diane, just finished an operation. And those that we know who are suffering or grieving at the moment, who don't know where they're going. And Lord, we lift them up to your love and power. We ask you to bless us as a community, our town, the Roaring Fork Valley. Pray for visitors here, all those working on the mountains at the moment. Pray that you show us a way of making our contribution to this place. And we thank you for the lives that we're given and ask you to bless us with the knowledge as to how to make them valuable to those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.